Hey everyone. I don't know about you, but I'm ready for some coffee. My favorite spot uh, because of the people, because of the coffee beans, all the good stuff is Cafe 211 in Bentonville. If you're not in the Northwest Arkansas area though, Cafe 211 also offers their, um, their beans and their coffee mugs deliverable, I think nationwide. Um, so you can create that whole experience from your home. Mauricio Guerrero is the founder of Cafe 211. He is from Guatemala and his coffee is from Guatemala as well. There's a beautiful story that's tied to it. I encourage you to check out the Cafe 211 website, check out Mauricio's story, the story of the coffee and the people who make it, and uh, go ahead and buy some and we can sip it together during our next conversation. And you can use the discount code CARAELVIRA10 to uh, get a 10% discount on your order. Good afternoon, Kate. How are you doing today? I'm really well. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm so happy to be here with you on this sunny um, Friday in Bentonville and in Los Angeles. It sounds like it's been a good, warm day. Yes, it's a hot day. <laughs> so before we get started, um, you have me thinking about pools and hanging out outside and like all the things I miss now that we're like finally getting back to the summer. I'm so excited for. Are you a pool person or a beach person? Oh my gosh, what a great question. Um, I'm a water person for sure. But if I had to choose, you asked me if I'm pool or beach, mm -hmm. I guess I'd have to say beach. Oh, interesting. Okay. I and it is ocean because ocean. I, I that's expansive. But I think if, if I had another option, I would say pond. Wow. Yeah. Very cool. Great okay. Plot twist. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome and oh my gosh yeah there's a lot I need to know about nature I grew up in New York City so we didn't have well we had the ocean but we didn't have that many of the other bodies of water. yeah 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 we had puddles though I'm sure lots of puddles and now I live in the natural state and so we have actually a lot of man-made lakes but they are very beautiful um so I might be a lake girl this summer okay we'll that sounds nice um, well, thank you so much for being here with me today. Before we go any further, I want to introduce you. This is Kate Eisenberg. She's a cartoonist and multimedia artist, and I'm so excited to explore what all that means and what you've done with those really special um, skill sets and talents that you have. So again, thank you, Kate, for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I would love to start at the beginning, like we usually do, um, and just understand a bit about your personal background and when um, these passions kind of came to fruition for you? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I've always drawn. Um, I've always drawn. There's, not, there's never been a time when I haven't been drawing cartoons, although I didn't really think of them as cartoons when I was little. Um, but like many kids, I just drew as a kind of uh, continuous outlet for my imagination from a really young age. Um, and I often drew animals doing people like things. That was kind of what I was reading and being read to in the books that I grew up with, um, William Steig and uh, Russell Hoban, The Chronicles of Narnia, those kinds of books that had animal characters as really central personalities. Um, so I just kind of imbibed that um, and put it right down into my, into my art like kids do. I love that. I did some research on, was it William Stagg um, yeah. today? Because you had mentioned him previously and I wasn't sure what he did. And he created Shrek. Like I didn't even know yeah. it was a book before it was a movie, which is terrible of me, but like, that's so special. No. And I didn't even know about the Shrek book um, for a long time because it wasn't one of the ones that was foundational to me, but um, the amazing bone and a lot of people love Sylvester and the magic pebble. Um, Caleb and Kate. They're just some real classics of, of his that kind of found their way into our culture that a it's lot of kids love. How impactful children's books are. You know, I think still to this day, like Eloise of the Plaza is probably my inf most influential woman um, in my life. Um, and she's a six year old fictitious character. Um, and I love to understand how animals in stories were like that for you. Um, yeah. And so you went on in your education, though, and you didn't just focus in art, right? You also, you got a degree in, in English. Were those things always intertwined or were they separate paths you were on? What, um, what sparked your, in, your interest in your studies? Oh, man. I think um, 
I mean, they're, they were always intertwined because they're both, they both have stories at the center. Um, reading and imagining the world through a fictional lens um, that always informed my drawing and it made me attuned to language and the way things, the way stories are told, whether that's in pictures or with a particular word. You know, in, in the classic kids book, The Wind in the Willows, um, mm -hmm. there are so many words that a lot of kids would not know but you would encounter them for the first time reading that book. Like the word impromptu um, is a word that I learned from that book. And I think that just kind of growing up reading books that did not talk down to kids, um, I just became appreciative of language from a really young age and uh, always loved English in high school, Was always, had a facility for it. And so when I went to college, I just felt like that, that was the thing that that I should do um, is just delve more deeply into storytelling. Oh, that's so cool. I um, I don't know much about what it takes to make like cartoons or, you know, little snippets, but I imagine that English background is really useful because you just have such um, like control over the, the English language and getting things out succinctly is, is not a strength that everybody has, but it's really, I think, powerful. Yeah, definitely. I mean, definitely drawing cartoons for the New Yorker, the caption is so is so key to the success of a particular cartoon and there are innumerable ways to write that caption. And sometimes just changing an inflection can change the whole feel of the cartoon. Um, so certainly an attunement to language is, is great for any cartoonist. And also just an awareness of the stories that inform our culture. If you look at the New Yorker cartoons, you'll notice that a lot of them kind of riff off of stories that are very familiar to our culture, um, whether that's Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven or the old woman who lived in a shoe, um, you know, really because these stories inform all of us. We're all kind of swimming in that, in that cultural awareness. Um, and so playing on those things and twisting them a little bit is the cartoonist's tool, really. Um, I'm watching Gilmore Girls again right now because I've run oh. out of modern day content and, and Amy Sherman Palladino, I feel like does that really masterfully as well. Like there's so many tie-ins to other cultural references and literary references. And, um, something that I really enjoy about it is it like kind of makes you feel like part of the club. You're like, oh, I know what they're talking about, but like, I mean, yeah. pop culture, everyone knows what they're talking about, but if there's something exciting about connecting through those things that the New Yorker does really well, that your work um, does really well with the New Yorker and, and outside of it. And so um, just really cool to be part of that yeah. shared experience. Absolutely. And I think you said a really good thing there when you said um, you feel kind of part of the club. Like we are all part of this cultural commonality of, of um, references and stories that have been told and retold a million different ways over time and across cultures. And so for me, um, studying English was just a way to kind of immerse myself in one, one, well, two, because it was British literature and American literature, but two kinds of cultural um, canons that we all are exposed to all the time, whether we know it or not. Oh my gosh. And do you keep up like the reading habit now? I feel like that's a hard thing for me as like a, <laughs> as a grown up. I don't know. Um, yeah. I know what you mean. It's like, it's especially since the internet came along. I mean, who anyway, but you know, that happened anyway. Um, yeah, I think um, we all feel like we have less and less time. The more things are invented for us to do, we feel like we're more and more busy. Um, but I do, I do really still love to read, um, whether that's, I read widely, whether that's like a book of essays or a biography or a novel or um, the kids' books that I enjoyed when I was growing up. You know, I always, I'll never get tired of reading those. Comics, of course, literary yeah. comics that I love. So many different avenues to go. And I think there is something actually kind of like precious about that time because the internet's there and there's all these other distractions, like to actually get on like a tangible like piece of content and like sit with it in the quiet of your home. Like I have a, a break right now between semesters. It's very brief, but I'm definitely reading like one book um, and it's going to be so much fun and I can't wait because it's so, it's so, it's so precious. It's so special. Um, 
little What's like, the book? I have to it's know. Gonna be, <laughs> it's going to be called, I think it's called uh, That Sounds Fun. And it's about hobbies mm -hmm. and passions and just like pursuing things that bring you joy and how that's really necessary. And I think that's a really important sentiment as you transition from one heavy studying season to another heavy studying season. It's like, how am I going to bring the fun into that as well? Um, so it's a little bit, probably a little bit self-help, but the cover is really pretty. And that's a really important selling point for me because it will live on the bookshelf um, afterward. Right. So, I'm a believer that all, all books are self-help, however they're marketed. So there you go. I love that perspective. Um, so you mentioned that growing up, you were drawing cartoons because you were reading books about animals. That had, um, when did you start to form, well, maybe let me take a step back. Were those drawings always like different animals, like separate stories, or had you always like had a consistent storyline in the, the work that you were creating? You mean like the, the drawings that I was doing outside of school? Yeah. So at some point you got to Stewall and that was, that has been involved into its own like world, but was it always, yeah. always create in that way? No, not really. It was, it was kind of, I just, tended to use my drawings as a way to explore whatever I was most fascinated by. You know, there was a time when I was drawing only boys with skateboards and surfboards, like, cause that's, I was just like fascinated by that world. I think it was about fifth grade, um, you know, but maybe before that it was um, mice. For some reason, I was really into mice that like, and when I say mice, I mean mice that acted like people. And okay. probably that was because for a long time, I was very small for my age, um, but mighty, you know? And so I identified with the mouse. Um, and of course, you know, there are innumerable valiant mice in our culture, like Mickey Mouse and Reapy Cheap. And so I didn't come up with that by myself, but I did, I did want to kind of explore that. Yeah, that's so cool that you chose the ones that kind of like resonated with, with you or, um, you know, had something in common with their their story. Um, and eventually you did get to, to Stewball and I'm super excited to explore that character today. I will pull up my screen um, so we can all take a look because I love the story behind uh, this character. So <laughs> this you explained to me was one of the, is one of, if not the first sketch of Stewball. Um, so I paint the picture, set the scene. Where were you? What was happening? When was this? This was, I made this drawing in the fall after I graduated from college. And uh, I was looking for my first job, which is a very difficult time for a lot of people coming out of college because life has been kind of um, set up for you in a certain way up until that point. And then you have the challenge of figuring out how to make your own path outside of any school structure. So that's when this character came to me. Um, I was applying to internships and jobs and I just, I, I was somehow became fixated on this character of a horse that was on his way to work, which is not something most horses that we think of do. Um, but he was, he was always wearing a bicycle helmet. Like that was, it, the image came to me kind of fully formed like that. And he often wore a tie as well in those early drawings. Mm -hmm. um, which is kind of cool because even in my recent film, Dear Death, he's off, uh, the tie is a very central yeah. piece. So that, that piece was there from the beginning, actually the crash hat and not a cool crash hat, but like a bell bicycle helmet with, that's white with red flashes on it with red, you know, hand, um, red clasp and everything. So it's not cool. He is not cool. He is going to work and he's kind of a worker bee horse. Um, and there's just something about his vulnerability that really expressed where I was at that fall. Um, I was trying to be one of those worker bees going to work to a job I didn't yet have and trying to fit into this world that was brand new to me um, and feeling a little awkward about it, honestly, because it was a new world to me and I wasn't sure how I was going to fit in it. And so I think Stewball with his bike helmet kind of just came to symbolize the vulnerability of that transition from one space in my life to the next and kind of trying to fit into this worker bee 
environment, um, which I didn't really feel like I totally fit into. So that's why in this picture he's drawn having fallen off the bike because it was um, a path full of accidents from the beginning, I think, for Stuball. You know, his, his route was never smooth. I love the, like the symbolism of the crash helmet and the fact that he's like a worker bee. I think that the worker bee route is like the safe crash helmet, like protection kind of right. thing. Yeah, too. That's like really that really yeah. resonates. Um, and, I, and I totally understand feeling at that, um, at that transition point, like you're like grasping for something to emulate because it's a different chapter that you don't know like how yeah. to do yet. Um, and so, oh, it's giving me feelings like when I was graduating several years ago. Um, yeah, yeah. Awesome. I think a lot of people can relate to that, um, to the vulnerability of, the, of any transition time in life. Is that where, so I remember reading a few different qualities of Stuball, that Stuball is a 20 something um, wine more than water. Like are those all aspects of that like post-college like life identity or how were the decisions made about, you know, Stuball's physical characteristics, lifestyle preferences, all of that. <laughs> his lifestyle preferences. Well, <laughs> you know, he didn't have a name at first. So his name, was not Stuball at the very, very beginning. Um, that came later. And when I, it's Stuball, it, I don't know if you have heard the folk song that Stuball, oh, Stuball was a racehorse. And no. I wish he were mine. He never drank water. He always drank wine. It's about a racehorse that comes from behind at a, at a big race to win the whole thing. But the person who's singing the song who's telling a story did not place a bet on Stuball. And is so it's a story of regret, like this horse that nobody bet on won in the end. And when I learned about that, I decided that was Stuball. That was my character to a T because as you can see, looking at this drawing, he's a total underdog. He is not someone who you would bet on, but for me, um, he just came to symbolize that kind of determination to to outdo the odds. Um, and so, yeah, he started out as a horse that walked on two legs. He was always that and rode a bike, you know, on two legs like we do. Um, but over time, he, I, I, uh, I evolved him in, I don't know if you can use evolved as a word, but I changed him into a half horse, half unicorn. Um, and I did that for some practical reasons, but also the more I thought about it, the more right it seemed for his character. Uh, because a unicorn is a creature in our culture that's so magical. And Stuball from the very beginning um, has been a character that's kind of between the body and the mind, um, between a sort of effort to fit in in the practical world and his dreamy ambitions to create poetry and to um, transcend his rather humble appearance and his humble lifestyle to be to be immortal in a certain way but of course he can't because he's mortal so when I created him as a kind of horse unicorn I was playing with that duality of the body and the mind and of a magical creature and a very earthly creature at the same time so that's kind of where that came from Oh, that's so cool. And I hadn't realized actually the evolution of Stuval. So I really appreciate you sharing um, how Stuval went from horse to part horse, part unicorn um, and all that went with it. I think what's really cool too is, you know, while Stuval has this duality, to me, there was kind of some duality maybe happening for you in that you were part of that um, busy bee world or trying to be, and also in your spare time creating Stuval, right? Like, what Absolutely, yeah what was your time like in that like you were you know 20 something in were you in San Francisco is that where you were yeah living mm -hmm. at the time? San Francisco, yeah. um were you like burning the midnight oil like drawing Stuball comics like was that a um when I've been in similar situations that's been like a like a mental outlet for me like a relaxing kind of thing to invest in something that was more creative like what did that do for you and I think it's really maybe could teach a lot of other people who are in that kind of space, like what creativity could, could do for them. Absolutely. Yeah. I love how you said that. Um, I, um, 
at that time I was working as an intern at a magazine. That was my first um, professional venture out of school. Um, I was going to become a magazine journalist like my grandfather. Had, he had been a, a newspaper journalist, but that was kind of a known path. And it was kind of the closest I could think of within my family uh, to what I wanted to do, which was to be an artist. Um, that was kind of, that was like, oh, well, there's that path. I could be a journalist, right? I wasn't quite brave enough at that time to just say, I don't need a path. I'm going to make my own. I'm going to like, you know, I'm going to start submitting my cartoons right now to the New Yorker at age 22. Um, I didn't do that. I said, I'm going to try to go this other route. So I did that. And in, in my off hours, um, I was always drawing, you know, I was drawing and playing guitar and doing things that express that continuous uh, determination and passion that I've always had to create, no matter what job I've been in at the time. Um, so yeah, journalism is, an, is just another way of telling stories in our culture. So it was not a wasted effort at all, but it just was a little bit to the side of what, of what I ended up doing, what I have done. Yeah, um, I, I can relate to, to that as well, for sure. I think that there's part of our 20s that is like we're searching. I feel like sometimes I'm searching for legitimacy. I'm like, I'm going to do this degree because it's going to make me equipped in this way. Or I'm going to study that yeah. thing for that reason. And ultimately, they serve us, I mean, a hundredfold, like for sure. But um, I think what's great when you do have like another creative outlet is, I mean, you are still, you're honing your craft at the same time. And I think you um, brought all those worlds together in a really, really special way. Um, so Stuball began where we are on the screen, um, but then Stuball goes on a journey and Stuball has, is now like the feature of several like comics and works. Like where do Stuball's adventures come from at this point? And maybe we'll speak a little bit to the starring in Poetry Con specifically. Sure, yeah. Um, I have found that um... Stuball from the very first time from that very first drawing till now has just been a really pure expression of whatever anxiety or ambition has or preoccupation has been on my mind. Um, so the best way for me to come up with Stuball comics now is just to sit down with whatever thing that's either bugging me or that I'm curious about or want to explore more and just literally listen to the characters with my pen in my hands. And I tend to draw really loose. I think you have another slide of that. Um, I tend to draw really loose when I'm thinking of the story, uh, but I know these, my characters so well, Stuball and then his best friend, Hammer Goat, who is a half hammerhead shark, half goat. Um, and their friend Katie, who is a ghost, a little girl who's eight years old, but she's also a ghost. Anyway, these characters I've drawn for a long time, so I know them very well. And they're also aspects of my own personality and world. So I find that if I just put them into a situation that has a little bit of conflict in it, I don't have to try, you know, I really don't. And that's how I know that it's, um, that I'm on a good track with this kind of art, because it, it truly comes from something so essential in, in my personality, um, including all the anxieties and the things that, you know, uptight things that Stuball thinks about. So this particular drawing that you're showing, Poetry Con, actually came from a time when I was contemplating whether I was going to go down to San Diego Comic Con for the day. And it was a huge pain to get there from LA, even though it was like, I'm, it's not that far, it's in San Diego, but still, like, I was like, should I go? Should I not go? How am I going to get there? And finally, I just decided, you know what? I don't want to go. I don't want to go. What I want to do is dramatize the ridiculous kind of thought process that I'm going through about this whole thing. So I, instead, I spent the day drawing the story of Poetry Con, imagining my character going to this convention that in his case is not a, a cartoonist convention, but a convention of poets, poets who are aspiring to, you know, to break through with their art and things like that. So yeah, it's about Stuball attending a convention of 
of um, ambitious poets. Who all yeah. happen to look like Shakespeare. <laughs> yeah. yeah, who, who all, you know, they show up to the, to the poetry convention um, dressed as Shakespeare. That's their version of cosplay. That's so cool. Oh, I love that it was about this Comic-Con experience and I can, I can totally see it now um, that you share where you were at when you were creating it. Um, I have so many questions from the story. So um, one of the, the influence, I think you mentioned one of the influences for Stuwall is Mother Jones or is, was that Mother Jones part of your life in some way? Um, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Mother Jones is where I was doing the internship when I first, when I drew my first Stuball comic strip. Okay. Yeah. The interns at Mother Jones, um, who are all really creative people um, who just wanted to, wanted to um, find their way into the arts one way or the other, um, created a kind of um, a riff on the magazine itself that we called Under Matter. And we put it together in between issues of the magazine to kind of blow off steam and have some fun. So the very first Stuball strip was a cartoon for Under Matter, the um, little known publication of the Mother Jones interns. <laughs> that is awesome. And Mother Jones, I was looking, um, doing, trying to do some research on that as well. And it's, is it, um, they're like niche in the market maybe is that they, they don't have any corporate people funding them. So it's, it like tries to be really like hard hitting, truthful um, journalism. Yeah, I, investigative journalism. Very cool. And I feel like your card, your um, like Stuball stories also get at some like really truthful, hard hitting themes about um, American life and human nature. Oh, and, thank you. Um, so I, I, I could see how there maybe had been some inspiration or, or tie in there. I'm not sure if that's accurate, but um I, yeah. I really enjoy what Stuval has to say about um, the world. You mentioned that this experience came from being on the fence about whether to attend Comic-Con or not. And that was to, would have been to promote Stuball. Would it have been, or what would you have gone to Comic-Con for? I think that year would have been just to explore and to meet other cartoonists, which don't get me wrong, would have been a good thing to do. Um, and that that's kind of a dilemma of stew balls as well is, and my own, which is how much do you live in your imagination and how much do you get out and let the world teach you what you need to know? And I think that's a balance that a lot of artists um, are always kind of dancing with. Yes, for sure. But I, and I, but I remember too, um, you sharing, you know, when you started with stew ball, you would go around like on your bike and by foot, like sharing the story of stew ball. And that's like a whole other avenue, right? Of of meeting people and a different way of sharing the story um, that like, you know, contrasts a lot with Comic-Con on its its size, but is, is maybe a more intimate way and, and maybe more personal yeah, to you. And that's really true. what was that whole experience like? And maybe that was an easier yes for you than to go to the Comic-Con that was far away with thousands of people. Yeah, it's true. It's easier. It's a smaller step to get on one's bike or to walk out the front door and share one's work. Um, but I think, I think both of those experiences, what they have in common is that I was an underdog in both of those settings. Um, I would have been an underdog had I gone to Comic Con at that time and still would be. Um, and I was an underdog traveling around San Francisco to laundromats and little independent secondhand bookstores and coffee shops and leaving my cartoons, which is what I did for the first few years that I was drawing Stuball, just photocopying and distributing, self-distributing those um, around the city um, and through my friend's mailbox uh, slots and stuff like that. Um, I think that what there, what's in common there is a kind of determination to to hold on to what you have to say, no matter what. And the world is really, um, can be really daunting um, for any artist, especially a young one who's unproven and unknown. Um, and so I think that in both those cases, um, I just kind of return to the spirit of Stuball, which is no matter what the setting, you just try to keep going, creating and sharing your work, no matter how, big or small the venue is. 
Yeah. I love what you said about like holding on to, you know, the story and what you are, are wanting to achieve with it. I, um, a few interviews back spoke with a woman who's at the intersection of, of like art and entrepreneurship. And she talked about, you know, students will come to her and say, I have this idea, but I don't know if anyone will like it. And she comes back to them and she's like, well, who do you want to like it? Like, do you want the whole world to like it? Do you want five people to like it? Like, do you want people who like dogs with spots to like it? Like there's um, a group of people who are going to um, find value in what you're doing. If you're wanting to build a community around it, you'll find it. It's just it's not going to be necessarily the community of the whole world or the whole Comic-Con, but it might be the community of the laundromats of San Francisco. Like there's just yeah. there's a group for everything and, um, you know, not trying to match your story to what the group wants is the way that you keep your story true. Um, yeah. to what it is. And I think Steve Wall's done that really, really well. Um, Great observation. <laughs> so Steve Ball has taken many forms. We just looked at the comic and this is, um, was a short like animated film that you created, which was super cool. Um, and With the bike helmet, the bike helmet and the tie. And the tie, this is a great, I'm glad that this is the, the screen grab that's featured here. Um, and the character that's, is this the character that's inspired by you, young Katie? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's Katie. Very cool. So um, you wanna speak a little bit about, about Dear Death? Sure, yeah. Um, Dear Death was the film that I made as my thesis film um, after after some time of being a journalist and an editor I decided that I was going to go for my um, try to put storytelling more in the center of what I was doing and to do that I went back to grad school at UCLA uh, School of Theater Film and Television which is a wonderful school. Um, and within that school is, is an institution called the Animation Workshop, which is a graduate level program of animators who make one film each year. Every filmmaker makes a film every year. And that film can be, it's an animated film and it can be um, one minute, it can be 12 minutes or longer. It's kind of up to you, but um, because animation is so laborious, it's quite a lift, even if it is only one minute. Um, so this was my film as a third year, which is my last year in the program, when I had kind of learned a few things about how to animate and about filmmaking, which was a new discipline to me when I went to grad school. Um, so it was my effort to bring together not only what I learned in grad school and film school, but you know, really bring together all that I learned as an artist up till that point. Um, all of the struggles that I'd felt of being a worker bee in an office cubicle who didn't, who knew that that wasn't where I belonged, um, but it, but I also knew that that's where I was for a long time, and that there were reasons for that too and things to be learned there. So Dear Death was an exploration of all of that. Um, it's about this, it's about Stuball who is being pursued by images of death as he goes to his job in a cubicle. Um, and those images are usually kind of scary and threatening like a crow or, um, or a shadowy figure who's following him. Um, or, a, or he thinks that he sees uh, a skeleton looking down on him in his cubicle and turns out to be his boss. So it's kind of a meditation on how Stubal becomes aware of his own mortality as he's living this very day-to-day -day pedestrian life while nursing these desires to be a great artist. So that's kind of the premise of the film. Um, and eventually he, just gets fed up with running away from death and decides to confront death by writing a letter and saying, what is it that you want to tell me? I want you to tell it to me straight up. And death says, well, I want you, if you want me to tell you, I want you to meet me in the park. Um, and so Stubal goes to meet death in the park to learn whatever it is that death has to tell him. And it turns out to be something unexpected, let's just say. Um, it doesn't turn out to be what he thought, um, either as scary or as um, final as he thought. 
So I can, I can tell, say more if you want, but I'll leave it there for now. Yeah, no, I think that is really great um, context. And I think that the theme of, of confronting the thing that we're terrified of is so important. Um, yeah, that's a great I, <laughs> It makes me think of, I, I read this, I did this research in undergrad about like breast cancer, for instance, and women will not do breast self exams because they're so scared of finding something, but that's the thing that will get you help earlier if wow. you do it. And like, I, st I mean, I won't even like, it is, I get it. Like it's a real mental hurdle. Um, but when you confront it, there is some sort of calm in like knowing. And I, there was a, a quote that I, I took from watching Dear Death. And I don't, I don't think it is the, the, the main, main, but it might, I don't know. I might just, is it okay if I just say the quote? Yeah, of course, yes. So, um, it was, so no matter how I choose to live, I'm going to end up as worm poo. And I just like, it was great. Like, it was just so, um, it, it made me laugh and it made Stuball laugh, but it's also like, so true. Like our time here is so fleeting um, and we can do with it so many great things, but eventually we, I mean, to me, at least I just, I hope that they, those things, live beyond me and don't stay with me and are not about me ultimately. Um, so I think it was a great message. Yeah, um, that is ultimately what we all have to face is that our time here is fleeting and, um, you know, we all end up in the same, in the same boat, so to speak, no matter how we have lived. And that's both very humbling and a, the biggest inspiration possible because we know if we were immortal what would be the rush we would you know we would probably just sit around eating grapes all day right. um why bother we could always do whatever the great thing was later there would be plenty of time but because we are mortal there isn't and that's kind of what stewball that's what stewball has to kind of come around to is that his fear of of dying is exactly in a way it, he's his fear of dying he's translating that into trying to keep himself safe in his life but that is in fact um, ensuring that he is not going to take the risks that are necessary for him to break out and live the life that would be really meaningful to him which is to be a writer um, and so what you're looking at in this slide this um, little girl who's peeking at him over the bench is um, for him that truth comes in the form of this little girl named Katie, who um, he doesn't see at first as death. He doesn't see her as anything to take seriously. Um, and uh, that's fine, but she kind of brings him around to, to the understanding um, of what he needs to know by playing, which is, I think, such a, an important thing for us all to kind of hearken back to. You know, we're all so busy and trying to achieve things in our lives, but for me anyway, as an artist, um, that playfulness is ultimately what makes life worth living and it's what makes my life worth living in terms of my creativity. Um, it's at the heart of everything that I do creatively is a kind of play and experimentation. And when I say play, I don't just mean like making stuff up, but I, I mean making stuff up in the broadest sense. I mean, imagining, reflecting, thinking about other human beings and their path, trying to understand other people, empathy. Um, so that's what Stu bought. That's what this little messenger comes to remind him of is to play essentially. Yeah, I love that the message does come from a little girl. It, it I think, you know, um, for me at least, death has been a really um, present idea during this like crazy 18 months that we've lived in. Um, and when I do go out and I see families though, like children aren't as affected by it. Like they're just full of joy. They're still on the swing sets. They're still like, I don't know where the masks are. They're just like having fun and like doing yeah. life. And um, like they, that is so, that is so freeing. <laughs> like I'm here, like covered up, like don't go near me. I'm not going outside. I'm not experiencing the world. And they just keep living. And yeah. for them to be part of the naive fun. innocence, but it is really beautiful and, and really freeing. Yeah. I really think that's um, 
that is at the heart of, of what I do, that kind of tension between a, the childhood perspective where you don't, you're not aware so much of death. And then the adult perspective, which is, we are as adults aware of our own mortality. Um, and that kind of, that dance is where a lot of humor comes from, I think. Yeah, so true. Um, Katie also reminded me of, so I love when something randomly that I listened to earlier in the week is like relevant to what we talk about when we have an interview. And um, on um, Pod Save the People, I think was the podcast I was listening to. And they talked about death doulas. Have you heard of this concept? Oh, no, please tell me all about it. So like I hadn't either, but just like you have, I guess doulas are traditionally for like birth, like preparation. Wow. Death doula. Um, is for anyone who will eventually die, like, which is everyone. And yeah. it is someone who walks you through like that confrontation of like, one day I will pass yeah. away. And like, that's not a scary thing. That's just a true thing. And so yeah. I want to have things in order so that I'm, it's not a burden for anyone so that it is a, like, as like joyful and like, you know, calm experience for the people around me that it can be. Um, and to like, I was like, oh my gosh, Katie is a death duel. <laughs> like she is That's exactly what Katie is. Yeah. So I love that. Um, Although, yeah, she is a death doula in that her job is to help bring animal souls to the afterlife. So yeah, she's a death doula, but in Stubal's case, he's still alive. Right. But he's mm-hmm. so uptight and anxious that he can't fully enjoy his life all the time. And he can't always take the risks that he should take in order to live his fullest life. So Katie is there to kind of poke him and um, draw him out and get him to take a little bit more risk, get him to be a little bit more daring in his life so that he can actually be alive while he's alive. One of the reflections I read from you about um, Dear Death and about Stuball was about how like one of the ultimate risks we take is when we decide not to take ourselves seriously. Um, and I wondered if you could speak to what that was like in your in your life, if you if that resonated for you personally. Well, you- definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, of course. Um, I think that, yeah, that's um, that is the that is something that any person who um, is a thinking person and also an artist will run up against and and a a thinking person who's also a comic artist um, is that yeah I mean like yes we are all going to die and we're here right now and that's funny in a way Um, and I think that we kind of we both have to we have to kind of keep that in mind that we're that our mortality while also um, constantly suspending disbelief, because if we dwelled in that zone all the time, it would be kind of a downer. Um, And we might, again, ask ourselves like, well, what's the point? I'm going to die. But um, I think comedy is a kind of continual suspension of of disbelief about that. yeah. So I don't know if that made sense, but it um, absolutely did. And I think that this um it's like intentionality around the sense suspending disbelief that's really powerful. I was I was uh, you know, as you were sharing, I was like, I'm gonna I wanna ask Kate now, like how do I do that? Because um I feel like I'm a pretty like uh, um what is it, high strung person. And so to not take myself seriously, I, I really have to like tell myself I'm not gonna take myself seriously, like come but I think you can choose to suspend disbelief maybe by reading um cartoons that bring you joy or stories from your childhood are those the kinds of things that you you do to 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 bring that kind of like less serious lens to your life yeah i think it's kind of it's it's a suspension of disbelief but also a suspension of ego whenever possible which is hard as we become adults you know from the time especially now with um, so much of our lives being taking place online in a certain way on social media and stuff, there's this constant awareness of, of our appearance to the world and of our sculpting that and kids start doing that younger and younger, which is sad in a lot of ways, I think, because childhood is such a time to not be conscious of oneself that way and not to censor oneself you know, ego and superego are ways of censoring oneself at the end of the day. It's, 
and sometimes that's necessary to be part of society, of course, but to be creative and to access the, the stuff that in your mind and your subconscious that's weird and interesting and funny, sometimes you have to put that aside and, you know, and certainly put aside the hope that you're going to be writing something great or writing something even good. You know, you have to just put that aside. Um, and so as an artist, one of the most important things I continue to do is just to try to cultivate the playfulness and the risk-taking that every child, that's their birthright. You know, they do it without thinking about it because they haven't learned yet to judge what they do. Like we all do learn to judge what we do as we get older. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, it's just such an organic and pure way to go about life. And it actually is, I think, really magnetic. Um, it really does bring people uh, together. And uh, yeah. I was certainly drawn to your story and your work because I think uh, you can feel that there's truth to it and there's like genuine passion. And um, so I, I appreciate the lens that you take in what you do. You. Um, so this is one of the more recent adventures of Stuval, right? That's like still like in the, in the works or it's in the, what is it? The sketching phase. How does that, how does that work even? Like, how do you develop a cartoon? Yeah, this was, this is an example of one of those stories that I just sat down and decided to listen to what was on my mind. And it came out in the form of this story. Um, this story is called How Deep Is Your Love? And it's about when Stuball, Stuball is struggling with rejection of his art in the world and by sort of worldly forces like publishing and fame and fortune, he's not getting what he wants basically. And he's really down about it. And you know, his best friend Hammer Goat comes to him and is like, it's raining, it's a beautiful day. Let's go out and jump in the puddles and have some fun. And he's like, I don't want that. I want to sulk, right? And um, I don't know about you, but I can relate to that. And uh, it's about how Katie comes to him and sort of breaks him out of his, of his mindset about wanting to sulk and what that means to him to sort of reset. Like we always have to reset when we face a disappointment in life. Um, reset with, oh, but there's, there's hope. There's, and there's hope in a lot of different ways, but yeah, this, this particular drawing um, is, is a moment where uh, Stubal is reflecting on like, why would he have wanted to publish something anyway? And he says, um, because I would feel important. I would feel more important. And Katie says, well, more important than whom? And he says, more important than everyone else who doesn't have a poetry book published, duh. And Katie says, I just think that's kind of dumb since everyone's going to die pretty soon, whether they're more important or less important. So this kind of goes to the, what we've been talking about. Um, and she, like any child, is kind of direct. You know, She's not worried about, about his sensibilities at all. She's just going to say it really straight up. And these drawings, as you can see, are really raw. This is the way I draw when I'm just writing out an idea. And then I'll go back and kind of clean them up a little bit. Yes. So this um, screenshot of it was so important to me and I chose it for a few different reasons. First, I think Katie has like a very Eloise spirit in this like expression. Yeah. Here, and I love yeah. that about it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and but though also I think that there's something so simple and powerful about like when you just like see your thoughts on paper, you're like, oh gosh, that was really silly. Like I this was so important to me because I want to be important. Like what? Um in um we learn like therapeutic techniques in social work right and one of them is this wdep model so we look at what are you doing is what you're doing getting you what you or what do you want and then what are you doing is is what you're doing getting you what you want and then what's your new plan and i think sometimes even you're looking at like what do you want like do you really want to be famous or important is that the thing is that the most important thing and i feel like Stu Ball's having that kind of moment because katie's like presenting it on on paper to Stuval or um you know like just like you said plainly stating the truth of like the silliness of it that we get caught so caught up in these earthly things so really powerful yeah. absolutely absolutely she's very good and succinct at undercutting his really big ideas that's her job thank goodness for Katie I think we all need yeah. 
that kind of influence. Um, and you, I'd like to hear a little bit more also about the, the choosing of How Deep Is Your Love as, as the title, which is, um, of course, a very famous song. Yes, yes. So um, as part of this story, the thing that finally Katie uses to break Stubal out of his funk is that she has a record, um, a Bee Gees record with how, that song, How Deep Is Your Love on it. And she wants them to, to sing it together and to do a duet. And at first he's like, you know, he will not do it. He won't engage with that level of silliness. Um, but eventually he can't help it. You know, I mean, sure that, and if you've heard the song, it's already playing in your head. Yep. Um, as soon as you hear that, that song, if you've ever heard it, it's like, how deep is your love? How deep is your love? It's kind of insatiable, you know? And he can't, he can't help but, but be affected by it. And so they end up having a really silly time together. And, and it is silly and they're having fun. But for me, and for me, what is kind of at the core of that, um, that question of how deep is your love, it's, um, for me, this, this particular story uh, that, that we're looking at came at a time when I was struggling to figure out how Stubal was going to fit in the world and um, feel, you know, finding a, more doors closing than opening at a particular moment, at that moment. And um, I drew this comic out of pain of that and, and fear that my stuff was never going to see, was never going to have you know, like Stuball in the song, it wasn't going to come from behind. It wasn't going to win the race, like like the prophecy in the song says. And what Katie reminds Stuball of is that just that question, just asking that question: How deep is your love? How how much can you love the whatever it is that you love? Um, you know, and that is ultimately the thing that is bottomless for all of us, whatever it is. It, that it is that we love, um, whether it's our children or our families in general or our, our work or our religion or whatever it is. Um, there are as many things as there are human beings in the world. Um, we're constantly being challenged to ask ourselves, how deep can you go into that thing? And for me, drawing this was kind of a meditation of just like, yeah, I may be facing some setbacks, but the work is always here and the work is bottomless, just like love is bottomless. You can always find a new layer down or up of love to go to. And that, that eventually is a huge comfort to me, no matter what the happens to my work in the outside world. Yes. And I think um, something that I'm, I'm hearing in you telling that story is like, um, that love is, it's like active. Like we have, to, I mean, we have to lean into it. Like when we're feeling like we're being distanced yeah. from it, like we have to move closer to it. Um, whether it is your work or your faith or like things that you know are important to you, but like sometimes they just, you're just having a bad day or a bad season with it. Um, it takes exercise. It's a habit. It's a, um, something that you feed. And I feel like, I'm, I mean, I'm really glad that you've kept feeding Stuval, even though there was moments where maybe you, you weren't so sure about it. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. I like that because, yeah, there's the imagination and the inspiration part of art, but then there's also the showing up to the page, to the desk, to the practice, even when it's not going perfectly, even when you're not, you know, spilling out ideas that you think are great as soon as they hit the page. Um, it all, it all kind of counts. So I'll stop sharing my screen. We looked at all the, the graphic components, but um, you know, along the same lines of, um, of showing up and finding new ways to show up, I think what's really special about your background is that you have so many different um, like talents in the area of creativity. You, know, you have experience with like music and audio and illustrating. Um, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about how those all fit together and like add value to each other. That's a great question. Um... I believe that they do. And I think that what's at the heart of them all, which I've touched on a little bit is, um, is storytelling. Um, and when I say that, I mean, 
you know, imagination, being able to imagine a different possibility. That's kind of the, uh, the smallest nugget. Arundhati Roy, the, the writer from India who wrote The God of Small Things, said that the smallest unit of meaning that she could conceive of was a story. Like she couldn't distill it any further down than that, which I thought was such a powerful and true statement. Um, and I think that all of my arts that I do are a form of storytelling, not to kind of arrive at one truth, um, but to enact a kind of imaginative um, stance in the world, a kind of curiosity about the world. Um, what makes this world, what are the patterns that I can find in it? What are the, the ugly things that, are, that I can marvel at and the beautiful things and how do those things feed on each other? Uh, there's so much to it. So all my arts, whether it's writing a song or drawing a cartoon for the New Yorker or um, making an animated film, they all draw on that same curiosity i think and a desire to communicate with other people to share experiences yes um i think there's always room to to practice in communicating i'm sure the new yorker um is a, is a great way to to flex that that muscle and it's a really interesting process i know i had probed you a little bit last time we spoke about like what is that like because it's so mind-blowing to me to um even imagine like the possibility of doing that kind of thing. I just assume that the cartoons end up there. I don't, <laughs> I never thought of, like how the people actually do them and, and all of that. And so in your day to day, you are not only thinking about two ball, but you are actively creating regularly like new content for the New Yorker, for other magazines and publications. Um, right. Like what is, what is that like? It's like going fishing on a regular basis. Oh God. Um, you know, um, you don't always know if you're going to catch anything, but if you don't go, you definitely won't catch anything. So it's, it's a kind of discipline of showing up to my sketchbook with my pen and whatever's on my mind that day. And sometimes I'll, I've gotten a little bit better at noticing the thoughts that go through my mind, like, oh, there's a, there's a good cartoon idea and like catching them as they go through. But if I haven't caught any, I just have to kind of go into my experiences, my subconscious, whatever, I'll put on some weird music and just sit down with my sketchbook and, um, and draw whatever comes to mind for a couple hours. And eventually I'll get into a kind of zone where I'm coming up with stuff that the drawings are interesting or it touches on something that I can kind of build a cartoon idea on. Um, and then once you have the idea, I really think it's not, the end of the hard part, but it's the hardest part, I think. And it's the part that you can't force, but you can show up for, if that makes sense. Yes, I it completely makes sense. And I think it's so true, whether you're writing a, a paper for class, right? Or you're um, coming up with a new project or product or whatever you're doing. Absolutely. Um, awesome. I am so true. Um, and I think that all of those things take a lot of um, like, vulnerability, a lot of resilience, um, a lot of um, just like hard skills that are really important to the human experience. I know that you're also um, a teacher where you have taught classes. I don't know um, if you are currently, but um, does that come through in those lessons? Like what are, well, first of all, what, what do you teach? And then what are those important nuggets um, from your experience that you share? Yeah, um, I am teaching now. I teach the second year graduate student core class at the UCLA Animation Workshop. So what that means is that um, the students are there for three years and in every year they make an individual film, just like I did when I was a student there. So when you get to your second year, you've already made one film, but it's not your thesis film yet. So it's a kind of in-between place where some people really try to explore a new medium, a new way of drawing. Some people um, there's a lot of different ways to approach that second year film, but my role is to doula, essentially birth doula those films into being, right? From each student's subconscious and their ambition and vision into being over the course of one academic year. And it's different for every student. They all have fabulous, unique ideas. And, um, and my role is to, to 
birth doula those into being, encourage them, probe them about where their ideas came from, try to help them strengthen their ideas, uh, et cetera. Is there, if you had could only teach, you know, one course for the whole, or one session, like what's that most important message for your students? You have one hour with them. Oh my gosh, one hour? Oh my God. <laughs> If there was like a, or, maybe, or like a tagline, maybe <laughs> I'm trying to think of like, what's the, like the happy hour question version of that? Like if you were to um, sum up your teaching in like one catchphrase, you know, what would be, what's that big wow. message? That's really <laughs> difficult. But I just, I, but, um, what you, do. you know, considering that, that we meet for hours a week all year, but um, I think that, I think the most important thing is intention. Um, is each artist's intention and maybe along with that, their integrity as an artist. And I think those two things go together. Um, what does that individual student, what do they intend? What's their vision? And then for story and also their, their vision of themselves in their lives. You know, everyone who comes to grad school has made a choice that's kind of a little bit more, um, intentional than going to college because it's like another time when you decided no I'm not going to devote myself to a job right now or not just a job I'm going to I'm going to learn I'm going to invest in myself I'm going to come to a new art or improve my skills and so there's there's a real beauty to that um, that I really admire and appreciate in my students that each one of them has made a conscious decision to show up for themselves as artists um, for the space of this program. And so my job as their, as their teacher, as their um, birth doula of their films is to keep on bringing their attention back like a meditation, keep on bringing it back to their intention, their integrity as artists their idea for their story. And then like, okay, that's your idea for your story. How can you bring um, that vision to every aspect of your film, whether it's the placement of the camera, or, which is a very emotional charged decision that every director makes in every shot, in every film that you've ever seen. Wow. You, know, you don't think about it until you've really studied it, but where the camera is in a particular scene means everything. It's like, what word did you choose as a writer? Or what paint did you use? What color, what pen did you use as a, it's all intentional. So I think that asking my students, encouraging them to become more intentional about their storytelling as filmmakers is the thing that I would focus on the most. It would yeah. be a great session. I'm sure it's a great many hours that you guys all spend together every week from each other really yeah I think too I mean it's just a great way of understanding teaching like, I think especially as a graduate student like you know how to do work I mean you're, you're there to be a student right but um I can like test to attest to the fact as well that like you get distracted or I get really caught up in the what there's so many what's going on but like the why Sometimes I forget. I was like, oh my God, I was here for a reason. Like I, I know I have 52 things to do today, but I didn't, I don't remember why I'm doing them. And um, if a teacher can remind you of why you're doing those things, it makes them feel a little bit less burdensome or a little bit less like random in the moment when you're just like so myopic view of, of what's in front of you. So I think that's really special. I think that's true. And I think that I can offer that as a, um, as an instructor who has come to this kind of art and this path from a really circuitous route. Um, I think that I bring with me the lived experience, what it's like to constantly struggle with, you know, how to put art in the center of one's life while also making a living and attending to other responsibilities. Um, I think that, uh, that that's, that's a huge part of, of any person who's trying to reinvent themselves, which is what it is to be a student. It's like, will, it's like allowing yourself to be vulnerable and to be playful in a certain way. Um, and uh, 
it's a real gift to work with the students as they go through that process. It's inspiring. Yeah, I know I, I benefit from this, the students that I'm surrounded by too as a fellow classmate and to be part of that whole, it's, it's such a special, unique time in one's life. Um, so I'm sure like seeing how different classes go through that um, is really interesting and valuable. Definitely, yeah. So, Kate, you know, as we're wrapping up, and it's been such a lovely conversation, I'd like to understand, you know, what are you looking forward to? Um, what's, uh, what's next for you? Or what are you working on that, that you're really excited about right now? Yeah, um, what am I looking forward to? I think I'm looking forward to um, getting better at what I do. Um, and I, right now, a lot of my focus is on my cartooning for The New Yorker and for other magazines. And when I say for those magazines, I mean, mostly, first of all, for myself, right? Creating those cartoons and then submitting them to publications and trying to, in doing so, kind of hone what, what it is that I do as a cartoonist, my voice, and connect with the people who are gonna resonate with that. So I look forward to getting better and practicing I look forward to creating more work. Um, I really would like to make that stew ball book. Um, so I look forward to that at some point. Um, taking those, all those raw sketches and making, making a book um, and possibly eventually doing some more animation, um, developing more animation from those stories. Oh, I'm so excited to see it. Um, and finally, what do you want people to leave knowing about you and about your work? Um, I, that's so hard. I think, um, I would come back to the Arundhati Roy idea of a story as the smallest unit of meaning, you know, is that I can't really distill my work down to one thing that I would want people to know about me or what I do. I mostly want them to know about that. I do my work, you know, I want to be able to share what I do with more people and have more conversations through my art and through looking at other artists' work. Um, so I think I just, I think I just mostly want to participate more in more conversations with people in the world through this medium of creativity that's so endlessly exciting to me. It is endlessly exciting. And I, I so appreciate the lens that you have into the world, the way that I think you take um, like big ideas or maybe intimidating ideas that are truths that we need to know and you make them accessible and um, you help us have fun in the process. And so I'm really glad to get to know you and, and be part of uh, your journey. So thank you so much, Kate. Thank you so much. This has been a total pleasure. Thank you.